Thank you, Robbie. Um, and also, I wanted to uh, just say a word about uh, tomorrow when we have this panel discussion, because I, for those of you who are young and maybe unacquainted with the creationist movement, you don't appreciate what you just heard in the previous hour, that you're listening to one of the two men who basically changed the entire landscape of apologetics and evangelical Christianity in the 20th century. And so it's... Uh, it's sort of like uh, maybe being in Ephesus at the end of the first century and being able to still talk to the Apostle John. Um, you've got a chance to, to interact with a key figure uh, in, in, that made significant contributions in church history. Um, my paper today will be on the CD, and I wanted to preface my remarks by saying that uh, there are two files, it should be, on the CD uh, one is a Word file with my presentation, and there will be a second one on their PDF file of a position paper, which I'll comment on later. But I, I, added, I had Connie add that PDF file because uh, it is just loaded with references. And um, in the course of uh, an hour, 40 minutes, we're not going to be able to cover a lot of the aspects because this climate change debate... Is, is quite comprehensive and involves a lot of different areas. So in order to give you the tools so that you can go back and you can do your research, that PDF file is there. Uh, when a lot of work went into that, um, both economics, theology, and science. So uh, pre please be aware of that um, useful uh, resource or tool. All right, in my introduction uh, for this, is it, it, what I'm trying to do here is train us how to encounter a contemporary problem and root it back into the framework of Scripture. And I think we need to train our people to do that. Um, otherwise, we wander around with Scripture fragments. And when you get involved in an issue like this, you need more than Scripture fragments. You need to be able to pull the entire biblical worldview together. And one easier way of doing that is to think, as we do in the Bible Framework Ministry, think of these key events, the creation, the fall, the flood, the Noahic covenant, the call of Abraham, and understand that as God acted in history, he also spoke in history and he interpreted those actions. So we have the action of God and then we have his explanation of what he's doing in each one of those key events. So... Looking at the climate change debate, I, I think if you're at all acquainted with it, uh, you'll agree that it's become a secular substitute eschatology. In one sense, it's a replacement of the biblical apocalypse. The way it's being handled by a lot of folks in the media with almost a hysterical fear, and there's, a, there's actually a spirit of fear embedded in this whole thing. And I'm not sure... Uh, whether this is a deliberate manipulation or the folks that are doing this are being manipulated by, shall we say, higher powers. But the point is that there is a, there's a, a, a really almost irrational fear of climate change. And unless we do something instantly about it, because we have such wisdom on how to solve problems, <laughs> that uh, the end of the world is going to come for Western civilization. Uh, last weekend in the New York Times, for example... Uh, Al Gore uh, went on a thing trying to defend why uh, we had 30 inches of snow and it's supposed to be global warming. And in course of doing this, it's interesting when you read uh, the vocabulary that's being used. Here's a phrase from his New York Times uh, ad, uh, his op-ed in the February 27th issue. He said, concluding after his apologetic for his position, he said, we have to invoke the rule of law as an instrument of human redemption. Now remember, this man has been trained in Southern Baptist circles. He, he knows biblical terminology. And what he's talking about here is a global salvation. He's talking about world government with an imposed set of rules that will lead to the redemption of civilization. Now tell me that that isn't involving eschatology and almost a, a counterfeit to what we t uh, think of as a, uh, a biblical view. And unfortunately, uh, over the last five or six years, this debate has split into the evangelical community. So on the, in the paper, I give you on a footnote 
the two different organizations that are poles apart in this discussion. The evangelical community has been deeply affected by this. Uh, there's one group called the Evangelical Environmental Network, the EEN, and the man behind that is Dr. Jim Ball. And the other side is the Cornwell Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation, headed by Dr. Cal Beisner. Uh, Dr. Beisner is heading an organization that I support, and they were the ones that wrote the position paper that's on your CD, the PDF file. So those are the two splits, and the problem is this, that, uh, and, and I use a terminology here, um, let me explain, in the, in the paper, I use D-A-G-W, D-A-G-W, Destructive Anthropogenic Global Warming. And I deliberately do those four letters because you'll see what happens as we unpack these words for what they mean. Destructive Anthropogenic Global Warming. And if we are dealing with a truly globally dimensioned crisis that we have caused and that therefore we must correct the human race, then it would follow ethically that we would have to be morally bound to support the, these policies. And where this impacts people in your congregation is if they belong to corporate structures, they are going to be asked and morally bound to support these policies. And the problem with this is that these policies uh, will involve a pagan view of nature, for one thing, an unethical treatment of the poor, which people have not brought out, the unethical treatment of the poor in the world, and a confiscation of wealth by productive people. And so it's going to impact. So now we have to think through how do we respond to this. So my, my presentation, basically 80% of it is going to be framing it inside a biblical frame of reference and applying it to different areas. And then I'll, I'll just briefly mention at the end uh, the structure of this uh, tool that I've put on the CD, the, the position paper. Proverbs 18.13 is a passage which is interesting apologetically, and it says, He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. The idea there is that every question that comes to you or comes to your people has baggage with it. So before you quickly answer a question, you want to stand back, pray about it, think about it. What's involved in this question? And here's what happens in the climate change debate. You'll hear someone say, well, don't you believe in global warming? Wrong question. It's a wrong question. That question already has skewed the discussion. So we have to back up and ask the proper question. Do you believe that man is the cause of global warming? That's the question. There's no debate that there's been warming globally. I mean, you can see that. Uh, it's measurable. The question is, what is the cause of that global warming? So the question is not being asked that way, and the presentations aren't being that, asked that, uh, presented that way. What you find is people will show endless pictures of the ice melting in, in the Arctic, and, oh, it's terrible, the glaciers are moving rapidly now, and there's no more uh, going to be gl no glaciation in the Himalayan mountains and so on. Of course, that was challenged recently. But, but the idea is that all of these presentations are nice, but frankly, they're irrelevant to the question. The question isn't that at all. The question is, what's causing it? Because if it's natural, what can you do about it? The only policies you can do about it if it's natural climate change is to accommodate to it. And that's a different policy, and that involves money going in a different direction than trying to change it. You're talking about two different policy choices here, and it depends on the cause of it. So that's the first thing. Let's get the question correct. If it is due to human CO2 emissions, then D-A-G-W. Now we say, it's okay, the A is, is correct. If it, if it really is due to man, then it's anthropogenic global warming. But even that isn't the full question, because it could be anthropogenic global warming and still not catastrophic. If there, in fact, has been other warming periods in past history equal in magnitude to the one going on today, and civilization did quite fine, then it's not destructive anthropogenic global warming. 
So there's two, those two letters, D and A, encompass what the, what the alarmists have to prove. They have to prove, one, the cause is anthropogenic, and then on top of that, they've got a second thing. The burden of proof lies on, on the alarmists. The second evidence is, is, if it did happen, and if it continues to happen through the rest of the 21st century, is it going to be really destructive? Okay, now, I have a slide here that I, I, I started by going back to an Old Testament book. Um, what I wanted to do was, um, I'm, I'm dealing with some college students who are getting the, 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 a lot of the liberal arts, class warfare, cultural Marxism in their textbooks right now. Everything is white privilege or uh, gender preference or class privilege. These are the buzzwords going on in at least the community colleges. So we're dealing with what is called social justice. So I asked myself, where's the book that you go in the Bible for social justice? The book of Deuteronomy. So here you have a biblical view of, of social justice. So in going to the Deuteronomy text, where would you find uh, addressing the issue of man and nature? Because if you back off from the climate debate and just look at the big picture here, Dr. Whitcomb covered that God is the creator. If God's the creator, then both man and nature are the creation. Now the next question is, what is the proper, ethically, the proper role between man and nature? What is, what is the role that man has in nature? So in Deuteronomy, we ask, here's a, here's a nation under God, with God giving statutes and judgments to how to run this society. Now let's look at the thrust of those statutes and judgments. What does he tell Moses to do? And if you'll do this, and, and you don't have to read far into the book of Deuteronomy to see this, that a central concern is idolatry. And Dr. Whitcomb has just pointed out sun worshiping, basically, is behind a lot of the, of the thing. But when you ask, when you talk about social issues, um, why is it that Moses is more concerned about idolatry than he is about immorality? Why is he more concerned about idolatry than social disruptions? Why is he concerned about idolatry more than environmental rules? Now, there must be a reason for this. And the reason is this. If you look at the chart here, the reason is, is that if you start issues at the political level, uh, people, and this is one of our problems today in our whole way we're approaching political questions, is that we, we wander around, we shoot at each other up here. The problem is political issues have an underlying ethical stratum. And you have to go back down there to the strat. The issue of man and nature deals with the ethic of what is the proper role of man and nature. So it's not a political question, it's an ethical one. The problem, though, is that you have to dig deeper and go down to the epistemological and metaphysical level of how do we know this. Instead, another crude way, it's this. The ethical issue, the ethical level is, who are you to tell me how I'm supposed to live my life. This is what I, ask, I tell college students to ask when some professor spouts off about we need to do this and that. The question is, and it can be asked respectfully and graciously, who are you to tell me how I'm supposed to live my life? What's the basis of your ethic? And then going down one further than epistemology, the basic question is, why should I accept as true what you're telling me? Justify your statement. Why should I accept as true what you're telling me? That's the epistemological plot. And finally, down at the deeper level, the metaphysical level, is what is the purpose of life? What's the meaning of it all? If the whole doesn't have meaning, certainly the parts can't. So if you're telling me I'm living in a cosmotic, chaotic universe that's meaningless, then why not, as Dr. Whitcomb pointed out, kill myself as a young person, get it over with early? That's a serious question. So those questions aren't really dealt with in the modern milieu because to deal with these, you have to deal with theology, and nobody wants to get the sued by the ACLU. So um, by, by, by secularizing the whole discussion, you've trivialized it because you can't have a substantive discussion up here if you don't deal with all the issues down here. And by law now, a teacher can't deal with this. We have Florida teachers that have to go into a closet to pray so they won't be seen. 
So once you have this, this, this whole secular thing, you basically trivialize all discussions. If you turn in the book to Deuteronomy chapter 4, a minute, and let's look at the text there. Deuteronomy chapter 4, and Moses is talking about, he's, he's giving a, a, an exhortation to the nation Israel, and he's giving them a motivation to, to go on when they conquered the land. And in part of that, Deuteronomy 4, uh, verses 6 through 8, look what he says about Israel. He says, um, verse 6, Therefore be careful to observe them. This is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us for whatever reason we may call upon him? And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all these law which I set before you this day? Take heed to yourself. And then he begins to warn about idolatry. By the way, the two good things to remember about the nature of Israel in world history is this. Israel is the only nation that had a contract with God. That's Albright, father of American archaeology. Only nation in history that ever had a contract with God, Israel. And Israel is the only nation ever and has the only religion ever to have over millennia of time, over century after century, a coherent set of prophets. Isn't it striking that all false religions only have one prophet? But isn't in Israel, they have a sequence of prophets that are developing this because they are allied with the God of history. So let's look at a more biblical view of the, of the climate discussion. And let's go back down to the drill all the way down to this metaphysical level, the bottom level of man and nature. Where do you go in the Bible to get some information? Well, what deals with, with nature? Well, the first thing is obviously the creation. You go to the fall. You go to the flood. You look at the ecological covenant that God made with Noah. So all these define man's relationship with nature. So we're going to ask two questions, actually two and a half questions here. The first question is, is nature the product of chance or of created design? Now, most people here today would say it's created design. But... Let's think about the implications on climate modeling. Now, climate modeling is guys get together and they get a set of equations and they're trying to make the equations fit how the atmosphere works, how the ocean interacts with the atmosphere. So I'm sitting here, I'm a climate modeler, but I'm not just a climate modeler. I'm a person made in God's image. Whether I believe in the gospel or I don't believe in the gospel, I have presuppositions that are deeply rooted in my soul. So how I think about these questions is going to influence how I devise my models. I can't help it. It just spills over that way. So is nature the product of chance or design? If the former, if, if the atmosphere ocean system is just a product of chance, then the dynamic between the atmosphere and ocean could well be a fragile system that is metastable. That means it, it's like a ball on the top of a mountain like this. Metastable means, yeah, that right now the ball's right there at the peak, but you perturb it, and it's going to go down either side. That's metastable. So if the whole atmosphere system is not engineered, so to speak, it could be metastable, and it could be liable to massive mis- misfunction when it's perturbed by human efforts. <clears throat> and I will, if I believe that, I'm going to model it that way. On the other hand... If the atmosphere-ocean dynamic was designed to be stable, then I would look in my modeling for some sort of negative feedbacks that keep it stable. And I would start thinking in these terms. So two distinct metaphysical views define the range that I would expect climate variation to, to work within. A climate modeler who is aware of recent creation, a climate-altering global flood, and a way at covenant will realize that climate change, if we have a short earth history, climate change was rapid. It was rapid in the past and must be limited by some restraining feedback mechanisms. In other words, you have these rapid changes with the flood, post-flood changes, you have the ice age following the flood. This, this all happened quickly. And because they were such powerful changes in the atmosphere-ocean system, they didn't run away. 
there wasn't a complete breakdown of the system. The system was stable against these massive and rapid changes. So, somebody believes that, he has confidence in God's engineering ability and in his providential management of climate dynamics. This is our Father's world. His pagan colleague, however, believes that climate process was very slow. It took millions of years to bring these things on. Then when he, that colleague, that unbelieving colleague, sees that, gosh, you know, the climate has really warmed up significantly in a in hundred years or so. I mean, yeah, it's one, one degree Celsius, but that's a rapid change if you believe in millions of years. So faced with a rapid climate change, especially since the Industrial Revolution, he would tend to view the climate change as out of control because it's, it's so fast compared to what he's used to seeing in nature. Creationists see God's design throughout nature, including the atmospheric ocean processes. Um, I could say, for example, one of the things the secularized view of education is doing to our children it's truncating their ability to worship God. Worship isn't just praise and worship in the middle of a, what a musician friend of mine calls the 7-Eleven music. Seven words sung 11 times. Um, <laughs> praise and worship is, is, should encompass every area of life when you look at science. And so one of the things, that snowstorm, there's two ways of looking at it. I like snowstorms, even if it does this. This is my back, the neighbor's backyard, knocking the trees down and 30 inches of snow. But when I think of snow, I always think of the analogy in Isaiah. When God designed snow, what is the metaphor that is used in Scripture? Cleansing. Remember? The sins be cleansed and be white as snow. It's a picture of righteousness. So you have to take this and interpret it in the eyes of special revelation. That's what special revelation in the Bible is all about. And then you can look scientifically and you look at the snow crystals. Fascinating thing, snow crystals. And all of these have an interesting unity and diversity. They all have this hexagonal shape. But then look at the diversity. You have prisms, you have plates. And not only that, but you can look at each one of these and by this chart tell what the temperature and the humidity were when that crystal formed. So each one of those tiny snowflakes is bringing down with it a thermodynamic biography of what it did. Now, to me, that's interesting. To me, that's a worship situation. When I would teach children this, I would teach them to be thankful to God for that. Look at, look at our God, look at our Creator, and look at the neat things He's doing. Every one of these little guys has his own little autobiography going with him. So that's the difference, you see. When you have a creationist view, you can worship. And then what does Jesus do when he deals with nature? He uses it again and again in his sermons, in the Sermon on the Mount. What does he say about the lilies of the field? Solomon was not arrayed like one of these. What does he say about the birds? Of the, of the, of the, they don't sow in barns, but your heavenly Father feeds them. So isn't that a friendly view of nature? Didn't Jesus have the idea that nature is a stable environment for man? It's not to be something feared. It's not saying be irresponsible, but it's saying we don't have this morbid, panic, hysteric fear that something's going to collapse because God is such a sloppy engineer that he hasn't worked out restraining mechanisms. A second question beyond the design question is this. Is the normal, and this is a fundamental question in all environmentalism. Believe me, I have had to deal with environmental uh, policy enforcers with the U.S. Army. And I have had to write rebuttals to this. And I can assure you that this is the hot button right here. Is the normal state of nature one untouched by man or is it one of man cultivating nature to its full potential? Let me go over that question again. It's a crucial one. Is the normal state of nature one untouched by man or is the normal state of nature one with mankind cultivating it to bring forth its full productivity? Now, you know which side the environmentalists are on. When they use the word preservation and they want to keep man from completely touching it, that's a romantic view. It's not a biblical view of nature. 
That's a romantic view of nature. And is present nature normal, or is present nature itself containing natural forces of evil? Those who believe in the fall, obviously, you know what we do. Nature is not neutral. Now, the major difference between ecology, environmentalism, particularly deep, is to go over to Genesis a moment. So let's go to Genesis chapter 1. This is the most offensive verse for modern environmentalists. Mark Musser, if he, when he gives his talk, you'll see what uh, a manifestation of this in the last 300 years. Very sinister. But in Genesis 1, 26, we, we all know this, we've read it before, but our colleagues uh, have not necessarily knowledgeable of this. God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And look what he says next. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Now, Henry Thoreau and the other guys in the 19, 1800s don't like this kind of stuff. And the European philosophers didn't like this kind of stuff because this is the way they interpret it. They think what we're reading here means that man can rape and pillage nature. That's their interpretation of dominion. So now in the context of the scriptures, what does God think about dominion? All right, let's turn to Genesis chapter 2, verse 8. And I'm indebted at this point to Dr. Beisner's book, Where Garden Meets Wilderness, for this exegetical insight. I think it's a great insight. What did God do on the sixth day before he created man? What did he do to nature? Look at verse nine, verse 8. He planted a garden. Now that garden was a localized garden. It wasn't the whole earth. It was the localized area that we created man. Now if that's the case, what was outside the garden? The wilderness. Uncultivated. No gardens. No plants. But it was the garden where he planted. And then he told man to do certain things to keep and to tend the garden and then to name the animals and so forth. There you begin to have the relationship biblically of man to nature. Nature is to be brought to its fullness by wise stewardship. <coughs> not to be raped, not to be abused, but not to be left alone. God didn't leave it alone. When he went to create man, he acted upon the wilderness to bring it to fruitfulness. Why do you plant a garden? So you can eat. So there's beauty. So that beauty wasn't there unless God, he planted a garden. So the point is, there's a difference in the scriptures between a garden and the wilderness. The wilderness is this romantic thing that people want to be pristine about. And that's not biblical. Because where you see dominion, you see man bringing nature to its full productivity. Now this is the unpardonable sin if you deal with modern ecology, particularly what we call deep ecology. And the, the, there's three words to describe this, three terms. One is that they think that we think of anthropocentricity, you know, man, it's man-centric. That's not our position. Our position is theocentricity. God has created, we are under God, we are responsible to him for the environment, but that doesn't mean we, we leave it alone. We bring it to productivity. That's theocentricity. Now, what the deep ecology people are, they're nature-centric. So that the use, recent study on the West Coast at taxpayer expense is that don't have children because it's better than a hybrid car. It's better than um, mercury-infested uh, fluorescent tubes that are supposed to improve the environment. It's better than all this because every child you have is going to have a big carbon footprint. So let's, re let's not have any children. Well, my answer to that is, you start it. <laughs> and when you prove to me, then, then we'll discuss it later. But the point is that this is the implication. This is stuff that's going on, and we're paying for this. These are published papers. Now, what else does the Bible tell us about nature? We know Romans 8. We know that nature has been cursed. Now, here's an interesting thing about nature and man and God. If you go through the scriptures, and we won't have time, obviously, this, but let me, you can do this with a concordance. Look up defile. 
when man is the subject of the verb and nature is the object of the verb. Just do a little concordance study. And I ask you to show me one case when man defiles the earth in the Bible that it refers to what we call uh, e uh, ecological abuse. It's not. In every case where you have that, that verb, with man as a subject and nature as the object, it's referring to a religious and spiritual idolatry that destroys man's relationship with God. And as a result, God damns the environment. So, yeah, man's responsible, but not quite the way they think. And you see, what happens here is that in this uh, diagram, the reason Moses is so concerned about idolatry is because it destroys the metaphysics, it destroys the epistemology, and if you destroy these two levels, the rest of it comes crashing down. You cannot be loosey-goosey with your God doctrine and expect to survive ethically and politically. There are lethal results. And it's just a matter of time before they come to the surface. So that's the metaphysical side. That's man and nature. Now we come to the epistemological level, up one. How do we know about nature? And this is an interesting study in the climate change debate. And that is, how do we, how do we know nature? Now, I've had graduate studies, I've had undergraduate studies in science, and I'll tell you this, I've never been in an engineering course, a math course, or a science course that's ever dealt with this. And that's the foundation of how we know. Here's God, here's nature, and here's man. God comprehensively knows nature because he created it. God comprehensively knows man because he created it. Man knows partially God, and man knows partially the creature. The two truth tests that everybody uses, including the mathematical modelers, nobody ever says, why does it work? The, car, the consistency, the logical consistency criterion, the, the, the logical proofs, the rigor of, a, of an equation set, depends on the fact that man's thoughts can be orderly because God's plan is orderly. Now, if there's no God and no plan, how do you justify this logic thing? Are monkey brains logical? And if they appear logical for the moment, how do I know they're not going to be logical next Tuesday? So the, the only basis for the consistency truth test is this picture that God, the Creator, gives us. And then we have the correspondence criteria that all science is built on, that man's ideas can correspond with factual reality. It's only because both are part of a unified creation. What did God tell Adam to do to the animals? Name them. That means the thought in Adam's head corresponds to the reality of the animal. How did that work? Because God made man to be the knower. So this is the basis, and once again, why if you tamper with your theology, you tamper with your science. But this can't be discussed in any public forum because the ACLU will say we're introducing and violating separation of church and state. Well, what do we do now in, in the area of climate and epistemology? Well, Climate research faces a formidable set of problems. Data sets are very limited. Do you realize that there was no systematic temperature measurements globally before 1850? And even in 1850, it was pretty, pretty scattered. Do you realize that there were no upper air measurements or CO2 measurements on a global scale prior to 1950 on a, on a global scale? Do you realize that there were no satellite pictures or radiation measurements prior to the closing decades of the 20th century? Now, isn't this interesting? The digital data that we have by direct measurement only goes for a century, but we are trying to say how the climate works over many centuries. So the problem is, in climate research, how do you extrapolate this big, tiny data set? And remember this next time you hear about some satellite pictures showing melting in the Arctic. Well, what were the satellite pictures showing in 1930? There weren't any. <laughs> so what are you comparing it to? I want to know the trend. You're not giving me the trend if you can't tell me <clears throat> what it used to be 100 years ago because you don't have any data on what it was 100 years ago. So what happens is the climate researchers, and this is part of the email traffic that you've heard about in the news, 
what they have to do is they have to use surrogate measurements, that is, some indirect mode of measurement for the past, where direct measurements weren't made. And there's a variety of, of ways they do this through ice core data, f- tree ring data, uh, river flow, things, and so on. So the problem is then that we try to reconstruct by measuring what's going on in the surrogate world to what's going on in the, the measurement world. Now, how do you know that the two are the same? Problem is that you've got to have an overlap period. And one of the email traffic that came out of the Britain, the UK, was that they noticed that the surrogate data was diverging from the measured data. Well, if over this overlap zone I can't get convergence, what does that do to my certainty about what the surrogate measurements were doing when I didn't have any measurements to check? And so, therefore, what they were doing is they were forcing the two data sets to converge by changing the terms in the equation. And you can do that but then you've, you've massacred the data. So this is some of the stuff. It gives you some idea about it. And there was a scandal that happened early on with IPCC, which is the uh, Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change under the UN. That would give you suspicions right away. Um, but one of the third report, I believe it was, or the earlier reports, uh, had this diagram of the climate back to 400. See, here's 1,000 A.D., Right in here, you see how warm it was? That's the surrogate measurements. And this is the modern measurements here. Well, now, this is what everybody was trained. I was trained in this, and this is the way it was in the whole field up until 1996. Now, if you look carefully at the chart, it doesn't require a genius or a rocket scientist to say, gee, how many cars and fossil fuel emitters did they have in 1000 AD? You see the point? We're we're seeing warming, but the issue is what's causing it. So how can this necessarily be attributed to CO2 emissions when this wasn't? So in order to deal with that problem, Michael Mann, who at the time was at the University of Massachusetts, came out with a more sophisticated statistical set of equations. And by the way, these are very, very difficult because... You're dealing, and those of you who had engineering, you know the problem here. You've got concentrated data set, North America. You've got no data over the ocean. You've got a messy data set from Africa. You've got areas of Siberia with very little, so you've got an an unhomogenized data set. So now how do you weight these? Do you weight the, the few stations in Africa that don't have quality control, by the way? Do you realize that the temperature measurements in the United States are not calibrated? I was shocked at that. I had to calibrate all my thermometers. The Army wouldn't accept measurements unless I calibrated them to NSIT standards. Well, NOAA doesn't do that. They don't have money to do that. That went away in the budget years ago. So point is that you have that, at that curve. So Michael Mann comes up with his statistical analysis, and he comes out with this. This is the so-called hockey stick, and it's called hockey stick because it looks like a hockey stick here. And obviously, if you look at that graph, you're going to be saying, wow, we've got a problem. And it does coincide with the Industrial Revolution. So there's a little so the problem is that. So Congress went ahead, and in, the, in your, uh, in your uh, CD uh, file... On page 6, I give you the internet reference where you can go check this yourself, where Congress was suspicious of this in the other administration. Congress got suspicious of this in the 2001 report, and so they said, wait a minute. Let's bring in statisticians that are specialists in statistics. And they brought in uh, the so-called Wegman report. And in this, in this p- period, Dr. Edward Wegman was advanced statistical specialist in the board of the American Statistical Association. So he's not a climatologist. But he's coming in and he's saying, you, got, you climatologists, you're great climatologically, but you're using statistics. Have you consulted a statistics professional before you applied all these statistics to this very complicated statistical problem? No. And what he found out was that you could put any data set through that statistics program and it'd come out with a hockey stick. <laughs> so obviously something's wrong with this with the statistical program. So that in the later IPCC reports, they've gone back to something like this. 
much to their chagrin, the hockey stick has been... The only place you see this is when the little children get it in their public school programs with the inconvenient truth and a few other things, propaganda. They're always shown this one to scare you. But this one has been refuted. And what Wegman found out uh, that I think is another factor in, in the role of science is man and the other guy say, oh, well, that was all peer-reviewed. You know what Wegman said to that? The peer review process is incestuous if it doesn't also include people who are specialists in some of your methodologies. So you can say something's peer reviewed. It doesn't necessarily mean credibility. Not unless the peers who reviewed the paper are competent in all the areas of the paper. So these are questions that, and this so far goes on to the whole issue of consensus. So we, we, uh, this just is a quickie. On, on some of the things that um, have come up on the epistemological side. So let me go finally to the ethical level, because in, again in the chart, I think I have it again here. Oh, there's a logical factor here too. I want to cover this one. There's a logical fallacy in scientific induction. And that is that if you have some statement, P, some condition, if P, then Q. Let's suppose that's your hypothesis. Or that's just a logical statement that you're, you're using as a tool. If P, then Q. You find that Q is true. You cannot conclude P is true. That's a fallacy. That is a logical fallacy. So if human CO2 emissions, then global warming, that's true. I mean, if you, you can model, so you get a lot of CO2, it'll, it'll increase warming. Then you see this global warming, so therefore you conclude that CO2 is the cause of it. Logical conflict. There could be other causes of the same effect. So therefore, the only way you, have a, you avoid the fallacy is you've got to disprove the alternates to CO2. What are some of the alternates to CO2 as a possible cause? One of them is solar effects. It's been well known for years, for years, for decades, that you can plot the sunspot activity against the global temperatures, and there's a correlation. And what's causing that? And the only answer to that is, well, we don't know how that works. Well, that's all right. We don't know how that works. But the point is, there's a correlation there. So how can you automatically decree that all this effect is due to the CO2 and not due to a solar effect? What about the ocean cycles? In the last 10 years, we've had cooling. What's, why is that? Well, it's due to, do we think, to the way the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans are working and how they work thermodynamically. Water holds more heat than air by many magnitudes. So that is not well understood, frankly. And then the other thing that's not understood is that CO2 by itself, if you doubled it, would only raise by one degree the atmospheric temperature. So you say, well, wait a minute. These guys are predicting five, six degrees. How's that? Because they're saying that once the CO2 does that, then water vapor is more in the atmosphere. <coughs> water vapor, by the way, is the real greenhouse gas. It's not CO2. <coughs> and water vapor amplifies the effect of the CO2. The problem here is water vapor has a property that CO2 doesn't. Water vapor has changed its state. It goes from solid, liquid, to gas. Every time it rains, you've gotten rid of greenhouse gas. You ever think about that? Heavy snowstorm, got rid of greenhouse gas. It all came down as liquid, all came down as solid. So now with a drain down of, of this water vapor, now isn't it true that the earth can then radiate more effectively with a drier air above because it precipitated out? See, these are things that are not really known very well quantitatively. So the idea of a consensus, the idea that, for example, all models agree only mean that we're all models are using the same set of equations. That doesn't prove anything. So that's all the metaphysics, the ethics, this is how we know, and so on, which is not well uh, handled. Now we conclude, finally, one area, biblical ethics. What is the role of the man and nature and how to conduct true science? Here's a problem that not only is it the incestuous problem of peer review, but many of you have heard that Eisenhower, before in the last few days of presidency, gave a famous speech. And it's one liberals often quote, the, the problem of the military-industrial complex. What Eisenhower was concerned with was letting public policy be 
forced by large corporations that support the military. And everybody knows about that. But I went back and I checked his speech. Interesting. Look at the next paragraph that nobody reads. Look what Eisenhower said. He's talking about the technological revolution. Is this revolution, research has become central, and it also becomes more formalized, complex, and costly. A steadily increasing share is conducted by, for, and at the discretion of the federal government. Today, the solitary inventor tinkering in his shop has been overshadowed by task forces of scientists and laboratories and, te and testing fields. In the same fashion, free university, historically the fountainhead of free ideas and scientific discovery, has experienced a revolution in the conduct of research. This is 1961. Partly because of the huge costs involved, a government contract becomes virtually a substitute for intellectual curiosity. For every old blackboard, there are now hundreds of new computers. The prospect of domination of the nation's scholars by federal employment, project allocations, and the power of money is ever-present and is gravely to be regarded. Yet in holding scientific research and discovery in respect, as we should... We must be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become a captive of a scientific technological elite. It is a task of statemanship to balance this. Now, if you're the head of a laboratory that has 400 scientists in it and they depend upon you and you are a government laboratory and 99% of your operating budget comes from Congress, what are you going to do before the next fiscal year? Are you going to engage in research that offends some of the uh, political intrigue and agenda going on? I don't think so if you want to be funded. So now what we've got, we've got positive feedback, all right. We've got positive feedback between laboratory budgets and the research emphasis. There's no research going on dealing with solar effects. Isn't this striking? Climatology research has been upped 20 times in the last seven years. Now, it's a gravy train that's going forward here. And if you're part of that professional group, you're not going to split with that because you're, it's, it's feeding you. Sadly, what we conclude here is science is now for sale. It's tragic to say that. Science is for sale. The highest bidder gets the results that he wants. So how do we conclude? Well, I wanted to, just in the last uh, a minute here, so my presentation, I wanted to direct you to the second uh, thing that's on your um, uh, CD. Uh, you'll see there there's a PDF file entitled A Renewed Call to Truth, Prudence, and Protection of the Poor. What Cal Beisner has done there I think is brilliant. He gives you the theology, much of which I've covered. But then he has a whole, and by the way, he's, he's used a wide range of evangelical scholars. This is what you have to do when you fight political battles. You can't go in there as the lone ranger because you can be shot down with an odd hominem argument about some little fluke or something. So you go in and you, you uh, are co-belligerents with people that you might not disagree with in every theological fine point. But because you're fighting a big battle, you have sort of a combined operation that you're running here. And... So what he's done, he's got a, a group of evangelical scholars together to define man versus nature. The second part of the paper is all on science. And he's got men who are in atmospheric science, who are competent, and they give you all kinds of references. They show you the graphs. It's a great storehouse of data. And then the third section of the paper is on the impact this is going to have on the third world. In the third world, people are burning dung and getting asphyxiated, getting lung disease. The only way they're going to power pumps to get water, good water, the only way they're going to be able to cook without cutting down forests is with fossil fuels. Take away the fossil fuel and you have damned them f forever to be poor, deprived people. And it's also interesting that when you hear this guilt trip Put on the developed countries because they owe more. If you look at the environment, you will see it's the developed countries that take better care of the environment. 
It is the developing world and the undeveloped world that abuse the environment. And what does that tell you about economics? Where you have economic prosperity, you have the luxury of then taking care of the environment. It's exactly opposite to the way they say. And we are not running out of economic resources. It is a simple test anybody can do. If we were running out of natural resources, you could go to the commodity charts and go all the way back for the last 200 years and see that prices were rising. But you don't. The prices are falling. So the price curves tell you that we are not running out of resources, that as we run out of one or two things like whale oil, God has, uh, as, as somebody said, it was fighting this whole uh, Keynesian effect and this, um, the idea we're going to be overpopulated and so on. Uh, Maltus effect, I mean. Uh, they said, you know, strange thing. Every human being comes equipped with a brain. And it's interesting that because every human being does come equipped with a brain who is in God's image, we invent new ways to breed out of nature productivity. So we're not running out of resources. When God said, fill the earth, be fruitful, be multiply, he meant what he said. There's no rejoinder in Genesis one and a half about carbon footprints preventing new <laughs> birth of children. So these are some of the big ideas that are involved in here. And I think, if nothing else, when people are involved and panicky about this, um, one of the things you can at least do is bring them back to the scripture of what is man's role in history in nature. So that's where you get up back up now. We can discuss this. But train your people to go to drill down to the bigger questions. Now just shut up for a minute. Stop texting and start thinking for more than five and a half minutes and read the Bible. And we might come up with some solutions. Robbie, thank you. David, can you give me a hand with that? Mike here. Anybody have any questions over on the right side? My right. My right. Then I'll turn around. We'll do the other right. We don't do anything with the left here. <laughs> okay. Anybody over here have any questions? Anybody over here know enough to ask any questions? <laughs> Okay, Charlie, I have a question for you. Because my, my gut feeling here, and we all know how...